so I thought I'd start out by asking how you both got into this, how you got into producing and established yourself. And Shane, when you were up at Hot Docs and um, when we met for lunch, we talked a lot about the role of serendipity. And um, you have such a great story about how you got into film um, that where serendipity is involved. So can you start off with, with um, tell us about that? Sure. Yeah, no problem. And first, just thanks so much, Doug, for having us here. It's really just a humbling honor to be with you and in the presence of all of these, all of you incredible uh, fellow filmmakers. Um, so thank you for, for being here to just be a part of this conversation. Um, yes, I got into filmmaking rather serendipitously. I, um, I went to graduate school in, in New Delhi, India at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And I was on my way there. I was I was studying the psychology of diplomacy. I I didn't take any any film film classes in college or anything like that. I I loved movies, but it was it was never something I thought I would do. I was on my way to to grad school, and my flight got canceled. And you know there was just an entire plane full of angry passengers, and the ticket agent was looking particularly distraught. And I went and I I bought a sandwich and I brought it back for him just as the gesture of. We know you're, I know you're trying to, I know you're working for all of these people here. Thank you. And a couple hours later, the flight, um, we got a new flight and I went to get my ticket and he um, upgraded me to a, a business class seat. And I had never done anything like that in my life. And I was so thankful and, and, and excited. And I went onto the plane and I sat down and the person sitting next to me was a producer from LA on his way to India to produce a, a, a merchant ivory film called Before the Rains. Um, wow. and he's, we, he's, we, we started talking we just got along. He, he showed me the script. Um, he fell asleep. I, I read it on the way from LA to Frankfurt, uh, where we had a layover. And then when we got out in Frankfurt, I just very excitedly told him all of my thoughts on the, on the script. And, and he, he was receptive and, and thought that I just had a, had a, there was some, something that he, he saw in my response to the script and my comments that I made. And he just said, you know what, you should, you should come down and see if this line of work is like right for you. You should come shadow me on set. And so I, I continued on to Delhi. I registered for my classes and then I took a plane, I took a plane to, to Tamil Nadu in Southern India where they were shooting the film. And I just spent 10 days with him and, and sort of saw what it was like to, to produce a film. The first day I was on set, there was just a 500, it was a day with 500 extras. And it was, it was just sort of like one of the most outrageous, exciting things I had ever stumbled upon. And I got to talk to the director and the cinematographer and the actors and the, you know, down the line, like every, every, every part of the, the, the film process. And, and, and Andy, the, the producer was really generous with telling everybody that I met that they should tell me sort of what their problem, the problem that they were having at the moment and that they should talk to me about it. And, and then I got to just sort of do some problem solving with different people. Um, and it was sort of this, this very tight, uh, con contained 10 days. I went back to New Delhi. I, I finished graduate school over the next couple of years. And then when I came back to the States, a friend was just making a really independent film and asked if I wanted to, and I, I had told him the story before and asked if I wanted to make it with them. And that was the beginning. So um, next the question, what kind of sandwich did you get him? <laughs> I, I remember a caprese sandwich. Yeah, I remember it very clearly. <laughs> uh, it, the, the ticket agent's name was Ramon. Right. We were in LAX. It, it's all, it's very vivid for me. What did, what did you think you were going to be? I mean, what did you go to school for? And what did you think, what career did you think you were going to have? I didn't really know, to be honest. I, I was going to school for um, international studies, international relations, and I, I had the intention of focusing on the psychology of diplomacy. Um, there was this really incredible professor named Romola Tapur that gave a, a talk uh, uh, when in my undergrad, and I was just, she she came and spoke, and I was like, she's the most impressive academic I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I'll just go study wherever she is. And so I, I went to her university. She ended up actually retiring before I got there, but um, <laughs> but uh, I found found another way. Um, and you know, even though that's what I went to go study, I it was very obvious to me when I got there that the real education was just sitting outside drinking uh, drinking tea again with the fellow students and like learning learning from them. Um, and from that from that experience, I think I also 
carried that forward before I was actually formally making films. I was just engaging with friends and creative people, people who I thought had vision and trying to help them in whatever way I could um, with their actualizing their vision. Yeah. The psychology of diplomacy sounds like the perfect thing to uh, study to get into producing. <laughs> um, Sarah, um, how did you get into film? I mean, did you always want to, or did it, was that also a bit of serendipity involved? Um, there was definitely a serendipity involved as well. Uh, growing up, I thought I was either going to be um, a nonfiction writer or a professor of cultural anthropology, which is what my mother did. She's now retired. Um, uh, but I worship, I still worship my mother, and I think I really wanted to be like her. And I was fascinated by frameworks of cultural anthropology growing up. Um, I specifically was interested in kind of looking at economic systems uh, and critiquing power through the lens of, of anthropology. Um, but I didn't really grow up thinking of like, I, I didn't know cinema existed as a kid um, or as a teenager. Uh, I thought of movies as, uh, you know, the blockbusters that I would see. Um, and um, they were entertaining. But when I went to college, my university had this fantastic student run film series. And I remember in the first few weeks, I saw the graduate Requiem for a Dream and Oh Brother, We're Out Though, all like with back to back. And it just blew my mind open. I just thought, what, what is this art form? Um, I just felt like each of them were these worlds that I wanted to dwell within. Uh, they were so cohesively rendered. So I started getting really interested in film from there. Um, I still always thought I would follow in my mom's footsteps and, and be a professor of cultural anthropology, um, but I kept being drawn to, to filmmaking classes as well. Um, and then out of college, I ended up getting an internship uh, uh, at Actual Films in San Francisco, which is run by Bonnie Cohen and, and John Shank. And they were kind of these fantastic guides in, into the world of, of documentary filmmaking. And, and for me, I felt like documentary could kind of bring together these interests earlier on in, in nonfiction writing and in um, sociological and anthropological frameworks, but in this kind of cinematic uh, forum. And so I got very excited and I started dreaming of being a cinematographer or a director. Um, however, the, the internship, uh, it didn't pay anything at that point. And so I was PAing on uh, commercials um, as like my side gig. Uh, our studio at that time shared, or the actual films office shared uh, office space with a commercial production company. Um, and so I was actually learning a lot of like on the ground, like production skills um, by doing that. It was, I should say, kind of in this safe space of, of community, it was very difficult. And I encountered a tremendous amount of sexism in doing that. Um, and every time I would want to like go towards learn more about cinematography, learn more about directing, just observationally as a PA on, on those commercial sets, um, I was ridiculed or laughed at. I was always put on craft services, made to be the production secretary, uh, put in these very gendered roles, which took me away from that kind of observational learning. And um, but what it did do was was it did give me these producing kind of fundamentals that I then, you know, I, I needed more work. And so I was able to kind of start to climb up as a producer in, in that way. Um, but it kind of took me uh, a very long time to actually get to the directing work. Um, that's, yeah, a long, a much longer story, but um, it, it took much longer uh, to, to finally get work as a director. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Let's talk more about that. How did you take those steps to work your way up as a producer? Did you like initiate projects or just, you know, work inexpensively for others? I mean, how did you get that experience? Yeah, so um, working at Actual Films it was great. Um, when I was there, you know, as, as their intern, um, I then became their office manager uh, as I was also simultaneously doing some of these PA gigs. Um, and then I became an associate producer. Um, I then though, I went back to graduate school because I, I was feeling a lot of frustration, um, disillusionment. I, I couldn't, I could barely make rent. Um, I had the good fortune of my parents living nearby and I would sometimes go live with them, but I was trying to, you know, really make my way. Um, but I decided to go back to school to get my PhD in anthropology, um, and, uh, kind of leave the world of filmmaking behind. But it was actually during my PhD um, 
experience that I met an anthropologist named Anna Singh, who some of you might know. Uh, she's a brilliant uh, anthropologist and, and writer. And she was uh, at that time working on her manuscript or her ethnography of what would turn into a, a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World. Um, and that's this, it's a story of many things about labor and capitalism. Um, and, but it, uh, at the heart of it, it, it tells the story of um, a community of mushroom hunters in, in the woods of Oregon. And the way she uh, presented her work was just so captivating to me. Um, it felt so visual. And after that, I asked her if she needed uh, you know, a research assistant. Um, and I told her that I had done a little bit of film work and that if she would ever be open to it, I'd love to talk to her about making a film out of her work. And fast forwarding through a lot of things, but I ended up deferring, I, I finished with my master's degree, but um, uh, and I, I started deferring the rest of my PhD. And I went back home to the Bay Area and started working with Anna as her research assistant and started to develop what turned into the first film that I would direct called uh, The Last Season. Uh, but as that was happening, I got uh, part-time work at SF Film, um, running their grants and residencies program, which is actually how I first met Shane. <laughs> so this kind of segues into that. Um, but it kind of launched me off into starting to really freelance on my own um, outside of actual films, which gave me a, a good foundation. But I was, yeah, part-time at SF Film, uh, part-time working for Anna Singh, uh, still kind of working on these production gigs, sometimes on, on commercials. Um, but then uh, that experience allowed me to get kind of my first like big field producing job um, on a film called Inequality for All, which was about Robert Reich and income inequality in the US. Uh, and um, that kind of led to another producing gig, to another one. Um, the Bay Area is like kind of a small and tight knit community. And uh, people luckily really do talk and, and kind of share resources. So I, I got to meet a lot of people through that world. Um, and I felt like in those opportunities, unlike the kind of PA commercial gigs I was working on, I could really observe what the directors were doing. Um, same thing with the cinematographers. Uh, I remember specifically on Inequality for All, Dan Krause, who was uh, an Andy Black, they were our two main DPs. Um, they kind of took me under their wing a little bit. Like I felt like I could really kind of see what they were doing and, and they were amazing guides through this uh, new and exciting world. So I'm forever grateful for those people who really took that extra step to, to mentor. Um, uh, so, um, but all the while I was like dreaming of making this film based on Anna Singh's work. And it really wasn't until I got a grant from the Catapult Film Fund that allowed me to uh, have, I still remember it as $16,000. It wasn't that much in the grand scheme of things, but we were able to shoot for three months in the woods of Oregon based on, on that grant. Um, and that, yeah, that became my first film as a director. Wow. Um, thanks, Ch Shane. So how did you then, what, what were the steps you took from getting to be on a set of 500 extras, you know, to, uh, you know, the career you, you've taken as a producer? And you, my understanding is you were not eager to be a director, that you, you set your sights on producing? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't eager to be a director. That's right, but I, I don't think I really set my sights on producing. Um, I think when I when I got back to the to the U.S., um, I just I had a lot of really creative friends that were starting businesses or making music, uh, doing conceptual art, and making movies. And I really viewed my job as just going to hang out with them and be there to be a thought partner and uh, uh, to help them actualize whatever they were dreaming up. So I, I did it in all of these different domains. And one of the domains was film. Um, I met I, I met a, a good friend of mine from high school, had moved to the Bay Area, and that's where I was at the moment. And he introduced me to some of his friends who were making a film. And it was just a small, short uh, fiction film that was in, in Arizona. And we made that film. And I was just there as the, as the script supervisor. Um, and I had that position only because that was the one that allowed me to stand next to the director and be there for him to ask me whatever questions he had about any number of topics. Um, it was certainly not because I have an eye for continuity. So I, I'm, I for, forgive me for all the continuity errors in that film. Um, but uh, the next, the after that, um, that the director, his name was Scott. We uh, 
we were making a film, we decided to make another fiction film in San Francisco about, about Alzheimer's and a woman with Alzheimer's. And we wrote a script and we had, we were doing location scouting and, and we went to one location at a um, Alzheimer's care unit in Danville, California. And we were there and we went into the unit and we met this woman who was taking us around and showing us the place. Her name was Lee. And as the tour progressed, we realized much of what she was saying wasn't making sense and was very repetitive. And we kind of looked to each other and, and there was a moment like maybe five or 10 minutes far too long into the conversation that we realized that she wasn't a nurse, but she was in fact a resident of the Alzheimer's unit. And we were like, wow, this woman needs a movie just made about her. Like she is far more interesting than our script ever could be. So we we tossed the script in the in the wastebasket and we decided to, to pursue a documentary about her. We went to the director of the unit and asked if we could do it. And she was so thrilled with our film that she gave us a thousand dollar check on the spot. And we were like, okay, we can, we can do it. We have enough money to make this film now. Um, and so we started there and then and then we we raised a little bit of money and we made the film, I think, in the beginning for just thirty thousand uh, dollars total after doing a little bit more fundraising. And and it was it was sort of destined to be like a really small, earnest uh, film. But we were really lucky to get support from the San Francisco Film Society and got a film residency there. And that is where I sort of professionally met Sarah for the first time. And that connection and that support from Sarah, from the organization and Sarah specifically, was truly what allowed the film to become what it wanted to be. And mm -hmm. they were able to make uh, connect us to uh, Independent Lens, who ultimately um, took on the film and, and released it. And it was from there, from that sort of very, again, um, yeah, like deeply connected, but also fortuitous uh, situation that I, I went I went to a few film festivals with that film. And at those film festivals, I, I met all of the, many of the other filmmakers that I would come to work with over the next five or 10 years. You know, it seems like um, you, you, you both illustrate a point, I think about misconceptions about producing or getting into film that you, you need training, you need to go to film school you know, whereas so much of it is just kind of street smarts and uh, coming to agreements with people and having courtesy and respect for others and just kind of rolling with the punches. Um, uh, you know, it seems that both of you have followed that path. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, you got to know Sarah from that project. Did you then, decide you wanted to work together on a film specifically or how did that first collaboration come about do you want to start sarah um sure i'll start so yeah at sf film when i was doing the the grants and residencies program um uh, I remember when I first met Shane, I just instantly thought he was um, a deeply kind and wise and creative person uh, who I like just enjoyed talking to. Um, but uh, we were kind of ships passing in the night um, soon after I left to, to make my own film and then kind of was thrust into the kind of the very, very busy life of, of freelancing. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, but in the back of my mind, Shane was always someone I wanted to connect further with and we would see each other kind of here and there at film festivals. Um, uh, but it really wasn't until, um, it was, it was Sundance 2016 that we, we really connected and decided to work together, but we were always like in touch and Shane would share projects with me. I, I, I'm sure I sent you some things that I wanted to get your thoughts on too. Um, but yeah, I'll stop before the 2016 meeting because that was very special and, and you can say what, what you want to say leading up to that. What do you want to say, Shay? <laughs> this is like that that movie of tell the same story from two different perspectives. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think quite similar. Uh, I, you know, when I met Sarah at the residency um, or around the residency in San Francisco, I also just thought like she was so just uh, uh, kind and brilliant and knew everything, knew more about documentary than like, anyone I had ever met and knew more about the, the the craft and the art of it, but also the world of it. And so, yeah, Sarah's being generous and saying that she showed me a project at that stage. I think I just showed her everything I was working on and wanting, wanting her thoughts and feedback. Um, 
and yeah, and, and it, it it seemed clear, I think for both of us that there there seemed like a creative connection um, and and also just a personal connection. And, and we were sort of walk, dancing around, working together and finding something to work on. And then we, we both had projects at Sundance in 2016. I I was there with um, all these sleepless nights directed by Michal Marshak and Sarah. You were there with Audrey and Daisy, I think, right? Yeah, and um, I think we both also, you know, I saw Audrey and Daisy and and left in a puddle of tears and thought it was just a a great film and also could see the the incredible work Sarah had done on that project. Um, and we we got lunch, I I think, at that Thai place on on Main Street in, in Park City. And Sarah just told me about this idea, this project that she had been working on um, in in sort of her 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 quote spare time, uh, not working with actual films, and it was it was the story of the Sierra and the Unseen, and I was just blown away by how clearly how connected she was to Braca, the late the our character main subject, the 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 amount and intensity of respect, but also the complexity of of the story that she wanted to tell, you know, I, I think I'll let Sarah describe it, but there was, um, you know, there's oftentimes it's really easy to just get, to feel connected to a character, to have a good plot or a good world that a film can live in, but rarely in the midst of production uh, was there, had, had I encountered then or since like such a, a depth and interweaving of themes um, in a project. And I was just blown away by the ambition and, and the, um, the potential importance of the film that she she had in her mind and and was working on. So, what was the next step in that? You know, what, did you come on? You were both producing. Sarah, you were producing this as well. So you're both on as producers, and you're directing as well. Were there other producers involved, or was it just the two of you as producers? Yeah, well, well, first, just thank you, Shane, for those incredibly kind words. I'm very touched hearing that and thinking back on, on that meeting. I, I should say, just to clarify, um, I produced Audrey and Daisy, um, and I was back working at, after my first film as a director, I was back working as a producer. Um, I couldn't get work as, as a director. And so producing was my day job. And I had the good fortune of rejoining actual films, um, again, who I interned with back in the day. And I was direct directing on nights and weekends. <laughs> and I was so I was just like, I love I just I, I love documentary filmmaking so much like it's it's my dream job. So any job I could get, I was just so happy to, to get, um, but very much yearning to, to grow into a director role. Um, and so this project, The Sierra and the Unseen, um, uh, I, I just wanted to do it so badly. And um, it was myself and my DP, uh, Patrick Coleman, um, for the first uh, year or so making it. Um, and then we had uh, some Icelandic collaborators. The, the film, I'll just briefly say, it's the story of an Icelandic woman named Raka Jonsdóttir, who is in communication with spirits of nature, which um, in Iceland are thought of as elves. And the film follows her as she's trying to protect this threatened landscape that's going to be demolished by this totally needless road construction project. Um, and the film kind of falls back in time to explore the origins of that road construction project and brings us into the world of kind of magical thinking around the, the economy of Iceland. And the film kind of becomes a meditation on like the power of belief in the invisible, whether it's invisible elves or the invisible hand of the free market. And, and making a film about the invisible, it was extremely hard <laughs> to raise money. A lot of people kept saying like, oh, how are you gonna show an elf? Um, how are you gonna represent the economic history? Is your main subject crazy? There, there was all those kinds of questions which were um, at times offensive <laughs> for us to hear and just challenging to, to put into a work sample. Um, and so um, I was at first going about this with um, our Icelandic co-producer Arnar and my DP Patrick, but I was really um, hoping to have of another producer on board, especially one who could help articulate and strategize um, around these, com these complicated themes. And so uh, when Shane and I started talking about this, it was just like, wow, he not only gets my like deepest desires, um, but he's elevating them um, and also listening so respectfully. Um, uh, I hadn't felt that before, actually, um, someone to kind of take this so seriously. Uh, it, it was very moving for me uh, to hear his enthusiasm around it and to like take on those challenges in, in making a film uh, like that um, uh, and, and not to not to dismiss it or, or not to shy away from those challenges. So um, 
that felt transformative. Um, and the next concrete step we decided to take was we decided we were going to uh, write an application together for uh, the Sundance Documentary Film Program grant, and I believe also for the Creative Producing Lab. And that was kind of like a, a test to see like how do we actually collaborate together. We we feel like we get each other. We feel like we're on the same page, but how is it in practice? Um, and I believe there is a series of Google Docs and and back and forth writing. And and I remember it feeling very generative, um, feeling invigorating, um, not laborious. And so I'm sure so many people on this call know just how extremely deflating it can be to write a grant proposal but I remember feeling that there's this a kind of synergy and that I was learning a lot and a lot more was being opened up in the process of exploring these themes and I also just didn't feel alone anymore um I, I I of course my DP was a close friend and we were in it together and my Icelandic collaborators were wonderful uh, but there's very different roles um and so to have someone like an anchor like Shane early on in that process um yeah it, it made me feel a sense of possibility you know um and that's everything that's such a uh fuel um so I'm yeah I'll, I'll I'm talking a lot so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and I can let Shane take back over but it, it was a very transformative experience no I guess I, I would just add that yeah I I think um writing an, a grant application is actually a really good way to start working on a project. I, I think I, I did that with Miha on the previous project and even Scott and I did that for the, for um, you're looking at me like I live here and I don't. I think there's there's a quality of just putting words to the thoughts and and making sure that you under, you're, you are listening to each other and especially the producer listening to the director, um, hearing what they're thinking and being able to translate that into, translate that together into a, a mutually shared language and a language that's also expressive and, and capable of potentially being understood by others. And, and yeah, and, and working with Sarah on that was a, a really cre creative, generative, yet yeah, inspiring experience. Um, and it also just helped us, yeah, helped us understand where we were with the project and where we wanted to go and, and what the, the, the elevated sort of dream and aspirations of the project were. And um, yeah, I remember that that was just a really incredible beginning. And then I went to I, I went with Sarah and Patrick to Iceland not too long after for another shoot. And we had and we were still sort of figuring out how how it was all going to go. And this was the first time actually being in the same place and working together. And and the three of us just like got along really well and and really connected with Raka. Um, and yeah, it just seemed like we I think from from after day one of the shoot, I think it was clear for everybody that, for me anyway, I was like, oh yeah, I want to make this movie and this team is incredible. What? And this filmmaker is, is, is just like, has a really unusual way of seeing the world. And, and that unusual way of seeing the world, I think was, and I could feel it from the very beginning, was just an important way that if I could help in any small way to, to allow that to exist and allow that to be received by others, I would be, I would feel very, very grateful for that opportunity. It, it, it seems to have everything to do with having a shared vision and realizing, you know, how how closely your visions for it are aligned. I'm I'm just curious when you went on the shoot, as you know, your your roles weren't necessarily clearly defined. Were you sort of on as producer? Were you presenting yourself as producer on this at that point because of the grant application? So you were officially producing it with Sarah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think it wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't like a, a stipulation. I wasn't like, if I'm coming on the shoot only if I'm credited as producer right. or anything like that, but that was, that I think was the understanding. Um, and, you know, I had, I had had just a little bit of field producing experience, but Sarah was much more experienced in that domain than I was. And so she, Sarah was also the producer on the project, but she had the call sheets and she had the relationships and, and again, I was there largely um, supporting and, and listening. Whoops, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> supporting and listening and figuring out how I could help, how I could help her in the project. Um, so, did you do anything on the shoot, Sarah? Were you doing sound and? Uh... So I was not doing sound. Our, our DP was running both sound and camera. Um, and then uh, sometimes for more complex shoots, we worked with an Icelandic uh, sound recordist named Skuli Helki. And um, he was another kind of friend, good friend of ours. Um, but yeah, I, I was directing and, and I would say 
um, yeah, there's like just a lot of uh, intuitive field producing that happens. Um, that this film is it's um, it's very much centered on Raka and her family, and that required uh, very close um, relationships built on trust. And uh, and so and all of us became quite close with Raka, um, but in like my kind of directing work, I was also like you know field producing because there's just so much those thin lines get so blurry because it's a lot of like talking just a lot of conversations quite honestly, um, figuring out plans together um, in this very collaborative way. Um, so that's a lot of what I was doing, and then of course reviewing footage and creating shot lists. Um, but uh, I, that first shoot was really wonderful for Shane to be there. He very quickly, um, yeah, became close to Raka. I remember within like a few minutes, they were both like talking about poetry. Um, like Shane found his way to, to very quickly connect. And she's not someone, um, she's, she's guarded. Uh, a lot of people have actually tried to make films with her in the past and have kind of ridiculed her a bit. So she doesn't open up to anybody. And, and um, but she and, and Shane connected quite, quickly and, and that was very meaningful for us as we were growing as a team um, and then from there we we had the right kind of foundation to all kind of explore um, deeper questions about the storytelling um, uh, and how to move forward uh, as you know uh, as we got deeper um, yeah in, through the, into the process. So Sarah you were still working at this other place at the time and Shane I assume you were working on other projects as well right so this is not like a full-time project you're working as you have the time for it right yeah exactly exactly we would i i think i went to iceland on in production four or five times uh over the course of three or four years um so it was and then we were trying to raise money in the interim and and you know shooting while editing while while thinking through how how we could tell the story and I was also working on, um, yeah, I was working with Petra Costa on Omo and the Seagull in the beginning and then uh, Edge of Democracy uh, afterwards while, while we were working on this project. And then I was also still not just producing, I was working um, with writing lyrics for musicians and helping friends with their like healthcare startups. So I, I was doing several different projects at the same time. Um, and also, yeah, helping helping several, writers write um, scripts, books, journal articles. And, and so it was just sort of patching together all of these pieces, but, but making films was, was beautiful and exciting. And, and I could, I could work with people like Sarah and, and subjects like Rock and be in Iceland and simultaneously be doing, you know, other films. Uh, and there was something very, uh, there was a, a freeing quality of it and also just an impossible quality to it too. Like, how could I, how is this ever going to work was, was the thought I was asking myself, you know, every day in a way, um, while also recognizing that this had some of the seeds for a, a, also a really beautiful creative life. Speaking of seeds, I mean, I couldn't help notice that the beginning of the film had so related so closely to Fire of Love. <laughs> That's actually, you're, yeah, that's how we uh, came across Fire of Love. Um, so that's, yeah, you, you uh, are, are quite perceptive. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Sierra and the Unseen or Fire of Love, um, Sierra and the Unseen opens with archival imagery of erupting volcanoes in Iceland. And we wanted, we basically, we think of that film as kind of a fabulist film or a film um, in tropes of magic realism. Um, and uh, that's something that courses throughout Icelandic literature and also very much kind of articulates how Raka sees this world where, you know, there's elves uh, and just life everywhere. So um, we were trying to figure out the right kind of imagery to bring this, um, this magical kind of world of, of creation and destruction to life and volcanoes so beautifully can do that. And so um, once we started doing our research of archival imagery of erupting volcanoes in Iceland, we learned about Katja and Reese Kraft who had filmed that, uh, not that many people had before. And so um, uh, I'll say that's how we first learned about them. And once we kind of found out that they were a married couple in love with each other, that they had this incredible story too, we just kind of filed that in the back of our brains and thought, oh, that could make for an interesting film later. Um, but yeah, it was Sierra and the Unseen and the serendipity of, of stumbling upon the crafts that ended up uh, causing us to make Fire of Love. Yeah, so much of this is so organic, you know, the way these, these projects develop. Um, 
So Jay, are you, do you consider yourself like a normal producer or like, uh, you know, I, I know you've me mentioned you, you consider yourself a creative producer, but do you think that's kind of atypical for other documentary producers? You know, what you do borders, I wouldn't say on co-directing, but it's very blurry, the line, because you're, you're helping so, you're, the director so much with their process. Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't think of myself as co-directing. The directors I work with are are certainly the directors. They are they. It's it's their vision. They carry the the the, the weight of that of that role. Um, so I, I definitely am not not even approaching that that. But um, I don't think of myself as not not that I feel so special. But I also don't think of myself as normal. Um, I, I do think that uh, that what I do is is weird and i think that helps me be attracted to other weird people that have a, a weird vision of the world and and aren't trying to replicate um existing processes for making art or existing structures of living in the world existing ways of living in the world like i think and and this wasn't anything intentional or or anything um i feel proud about i think it was just a function of not knowing how to not knowing how to live normally in the world or not knowing how to live like my friends or my family or what the expectations were. And, and it wasn't even, it was partly rebellious, but it was mostly um, a function of just not being able to, to fit in or, or do the things as I was supposed to do them. I mean, I, I even remember, you know, the, the first job I got in San Francisco, I had sent the application, you know, so many times and tried to call them and tried to just get an interview and I couldn't get an interview. And the only way I got it, got in was I followed the UPS delivery person as they opened the door into the office and walked upstairs and just introduced myself to the HR person and, and, and spoke to them. And that's how I got my first job because some, some way of like writing it down on paper or presenting myself, no matter what job I was applying to just wasn't working. And so I knew I had it to, I knew I had to do something differently. And I think that experience sort of showed me that whatever I was going to do moving forward also had to be um, in accordance with my own, uh, with my singularity and my singularity is not that special. It, it would be that way for everybody else's singularity. Um, so yes, when to answer your question more succinctly, I do think the way I produce is, is slightly different than other producers I've, I've seen. Um, but one of the things I've learned is that um, it's, it would be really hard for me to produce the way I produce if I didn't have the support of, and and collaboration of other producers who can work with me to to um, balance out my weaknesses and support my strengths, and so that's I think one of the things that really worked when I was with Sarah on the Seer and the Unseen. Um, I could she was really the first uh, like uh, producer that could could actually produce an entire film by herself that I had ever worked with, and I I got to see what it was like for that to work with that kind of producer, and I learned so much working with her. Um, both how to interact with the director, but also how to collaborate with the producer. And since then, I've, I've, I've learned that time and time again, that finding a team of producers where, where you collectively can, can make up the role of what needs to happen as a producer is, is very effective so that we can bring our own weird and, and special skills into a production that make the film actually special. Right. Well, you've, You've worked with teams of producers on on films like Edge of Democracy and uh, Navalny, for one. Um, how is working, you know, your role as a producer on those kinds of films with the team differ from your collaboration with Sarah? Um, you know, I think it's it's similar in that, uh, you know, and, and Sarah and I have worked with other producers too on on our films, um, but I think it's a uh, it's. It's not so dissimilar. I think it's it's the other producers and the directors kind of understanding, you know, one one thing that has to happen between a director and a producer, I think, is that you have to have a shared vision. You have to sort of understand where the where you both where the director wants the film to go and how you can both help it get there. But the other thing is understanding how you can bring the best out of each other and and where the other person's skills can actually make the film the best version uh, of the film. And so I think it's it's working working with Sarah and and have and sort of seeing the the genius and extraordinary qualities of Sarah and I think Sarah also being able to see some of the small ways that I would be able to help 
create that. And that was the same in Navalny, for instance, where working with Odessa and Diane and Mel, they all brought very unique skills and perspectives to the film, but they also saw that I brought something that wasn't that that wasn't there or that could elevate the film in a way that um, wouldn't wouldn't have happened if, if it wasn't our collaboration. And so I think there's also a quality of seeing each other and listening to each other um, that's essential. When you two work together, um, who does the nuts and bolts dirty work of producing, you know, the uh, the contracts, the E&O insurance, the deliverables, um, all those wonderful things that we love so much about producing. Uh, it's evolved over time on, on Sierra Leone scene. I, I did all of that, um, but uh, throughout our other projects, um, Shane, you've certainly had a hand in those, uh, but I feel like Elijah Stevens is a producer we've worked with a lot. He's um, started out as an associate producer on Sierra Leone scene and is someone we've, we've carried through in a lot of our projects. He's extraordinary at not just kind of the creative work too, but also the nuts and bolts, dirty work. Um, oh, I shouldn't say dirty work, but but that kind of you know that that uh, uh, yeah, painstaking, detail oriented uh, budgeting, scheduling. Um, but yeah, we've worked with a, a number of producers. Shane, I should let you you take over and and explain more of this. No, no, I, yeah, I think it has evolved, and it, it also depends on what what is dirty work, what's considered dirty work. There is certainly like the shoveling of the dirt that is as dirty for sure, like when when bad things happen. But I think, uh, you know, for me, I, I I tend to like be across contracts and and focusing on, on fundraising and sales and, and overall strategy, um, which I think for some producers is the dirty work for sure. Um, but then Sarah or some of the other producers I work with, yeah, are more across logistics, budgeting, um, post, you know, um, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a combination, I think. Um, and, and yeah, and I think there, there's another quality of, you know, working with some other producers, you know, there, I think one thing that falls to me oftentimes is the, the human relations or human resources de department, uh, which I know for some of the other producers I work with would be the worst thing they could ever do with their time. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a balance. And I think that's what good collaborations are made of where, one person's uh, one person's cleanliness is another person's dirtiness. I guess something like that. Yeah, yeah. I I just want to briefly follow up on, on that too because Shane um, is particularly unique in his emphasis on building processes um, that um, are deeply ethical. And I think that all of us know how incredibly challenging it is to work in documentary film um, and that you really need trust and you really need honesty in a process. Um, and sometimes when you're moving really fast and things are super stressful, some, those things can get sacrificed. And I've seen that happen on other projects, uh, but working with Shane, it does not happen. Like Sarah, he, can you give examples of ethical uh, ethical process or you know uh, um, something that comes to mind? With the, the, there's... Um, I think people often think of the idea of strategy as something where you don't necessarily like uh, are not necessarily the most forthcoming and that there are ways of spinning things to the advantage of a project, whether you're working with a sales agent or or with subjects or with um, financing, trying to raise that money. Um, but there can be become a dangerous uh, area where uh, uh, strategy can, um, I think, obscure um, truth. Um, or uh, directness, honesty, um, and in the name of getting what you want, it's, you know, could come back to like, you know, political philosophical questions of Machiavelli, you know, does ends justify the means? And um, I, I don't mean to, to digress, but, but these are real questions. And um, sometimes those sacrificing of, um, of, uh, yeah, of something that's good and ethical, um, uh, it's um, horrible things can happen. Uh, uh, people are, can be treated with deep disrespect. It can derail projects. Um, so um, all to say when you prioritize uh, uh, a kind of clarity uh, of communication, um, respect towards all people involved, subjects, 
financiers, uh, you know, everyone. Um, it's it's just a much better <laughs> way way to be, um, where that kind of uh, equity and and justice are at the center uh, of all things, and I think they radiate from there. Um, and Shane really does kind of mind that in, in his pr processes and sets a tone for all the teams he, he works with. And I think that that's particularly difficult to, to do. Um, uh, but I, I'm really in awe of that. I, I think it causes people to, to rise, to, to make sure that they're constantly checking in with themselves um, and thinking about how they're treating other people on the team, as well as kind of the, the wider relationships that go into to making a film. Um, and I'm, yeah, uh, I, he's very humble, so he's not going to say that. So I just want to make sure I, I say that here because it's so much, it is part of that HR box that, that he briefly mentioned, but I think deserves a little bit more um, unpacking. Well, if I can just, I'll say just one other thing about that, which is, yeah, and I, I feel very grateful for the other producers and directors I work with who do some of the nuts and bolts that allow me to, to focus on this part because it, it's so crucial and it's so neglected, I think, in a lot of productions. And that is just how do we understand, you know, what we have to give in this world and how do we give it and how do we give it in the most in, in a way that's true to our values that has integrity inside of it and that has at its core the, the, the genuine artistic vision that we're trying to trying to create and present in the world. And how do we ask that question of ourselves at each step along the way? So when we think of building processes, it's, you know, it's how how do we give notes collectively? On a, on a cut, just for instance, and how do we actually listen to everybody's words and take, not worry about what doesn't make sense, but take from them what is gonna help the film and 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 use everything that comes our way to, to um, make ourselves and make this project that we're working on, on better. Um, and I think that's, and, and then I think the other thing is, you know, managing, working with people in extremely stressful situations and where where everything is lost every day and and reminding ourselves that you know we are who we are in the best of times and we are who we are in the worst of times and how we are when things are are going poorly is is a part of is a part of ourselves and if we're constantly trying to be you know creators and and somewhat you know paragons for others then that has to apply at, at any moment along the process and and I think it's just this, you know, one of the things um, Daniel once said, Daniel said to me was, you know, he was like joking around and saying, he was like saying, you're like a hockey coach that after the player scores the hat trick, you say like, okay, now it's time to practice more. And I, and I, I feel that quality of just like always, always gently and compassionately pushing myself and pushing every, pushing with everyone around me to, 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 um, yeah, to, to, to make the best thing we can make and to be, to be someone that we want to be too. I'm just curious, have you ever had to fire or let go of somebody who wasn't kind of on the mission, you know, who didn't get this and uh, was creating drama or problems? I, yeah, I have. Yeah, we have and have probably not, have both fired or not fired. I've never like said you are fired, but um, I have been able to, we have been able to move productions away or, or quarantine um, responsibilities or, or in, in influences in a project when it's not working out, certainly. And sometimes it's gone on longer than I would have liked it to. And sometimes we, we've been able to do it relatively efficiently. Um, yeah, definitely. But I, I feel that process when, when, you know, when you make a film or the way, the way we do it is you build a team. And so when there's, when there's a team, it's a little bit, it's, I've never, I've never said like, you know, there's, there's probably been more like riding the bench or to continue the coach metaphor than there has been, been firing or something like that. Yeah. By the way, there, there are a lot of good questions in the chat and I just want to recognize them that um, I will leave some time uh, for questions from you guys. So um, uh, when the time comes, or you can even start using the raised hand function. Um, we may not get to it for a few minutes, but if you do have a question, um, we will, we'll go to you. Uh, I am also curious, do you guys have contracts or agreements that you have between yourselves on your projects? You know, do you write out deal points, as it were? We have that crayon copy somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but in all seriousness, yes, we... Um, 
we we on Seer in the Unseen, we we started out by doing that. Um, uh, and yeah, all of our projects that we have a few in development right now, which we haven't actually done that process yet, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. But um, but yeah, in all of our projects, we had had contracts in place. Um, and that was important. Both of us have had complexity with contracts in the past. And so even though there was like a level of, of trust between us, we still also both acknowledge how important kind of papering things was and that furthered the trust building between us, I would say, don't you think? Yeah. So let's talk about, um, you know, again, coming back to the team and stuff, you brought on, you, uh, even on your own things, you, you bring on like producers or executive producers. How do you go about that? At what point do you bring someone in? Like, for instance, on Fire of Love, you work with Ina Fitchman as a producer as well, right? Um, at what point did she come on and what role did she play that added to what, you know, you were doing? Go for uh, yeah, um, I, I know it came on. So Sarah and I had sort of talked about Fire of Love for quite some time and uh, had started writing out a little bit of what we, we wanted the film to be and we're, we're underway and talking to editors about doing a development reel. But I had worked, Ina was the um, executive producer with me on Stray, a film that I produced with Eliz that Elizabeth Lowe directed. And so I had, I had known Ina and uh, Ina is from Montreal and and speaks French and has had familiarity with um, French archives and 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 so we once we started to to get the archive process once we started to know that we needed the archive we Ina came on board to to lead with Sarah and Eli Sarah uh, that process um, and then we had Sarah had met Sand Sandbox um, Greg and Jess uh, several years before at a at a Sundance Sandbox retreat. And they had always, we had mentioned the project to them and they were really interested. And then the, the you know, I think we, Sarah and I had talked to Jess about it uh, um, over the phone as they were supporting another project that we were working on, we were in development on. And then I know Sarah and I met with Greg and Jess and, and the, that, that was the beginning of them coming on board in a development ca capacity to begin with, where we put together a, a, a development reel with one of our editors, Jocelyn Chapu, um, with Erin Casper, like uh, deeply involved. She's she's always she's been a collaborator with Sarah on every project, and that was the beginning of that was sort of the origin of that team assembly. And what about executive producers? When do they? What do they do besides you know look for money? Or something do they take on any additional role uh how do you navigate multiple executive producers or um and and why the need for so many i mean i see so many documentaries now that have yeah. you know a dozen eps on it yeah for fire of love uh sandbox were our eps uh i know was a producer and and greg and jess were eps along with um josh braun and and ben braun who are um our sales agents, but also really came on early in the project and 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 also participated in in more than just sales. Um, for us, yeah, we we were lucky. Um, Sandbox was really our only financier, so we didn't have to work with many EPs, and didn't, there weren't many stakeholders. We we also got some grants and some financing from the Canadian tax credits, but it was essentially just one one equity partner, and they were involved. Um, yeah, they were involved uh, quite a bit. You know, we we talked to them regularly. They they would see cuts. We would tell them our ideas for the project. They made introductions for us. Uh, uh, Miranda July uh, came in in thanks to to Sandbox, um, and yeah, they were really integral parts of the of the process for sure. And I think that's that's a part of Sarah's leadership style too, as she's really in, incredible at bringing everyone in. Uh, to help make the film and and opening up a very collaborative space. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're giving notes, right? When they see the cuts. Yeah, yeah, and they give they give a lot of, a lot of notes and a lot of great notes. Yeah. Um, again, I see a lot of uh, questions being posed in the chat, so I just um, urge you folks to like use the raised hand function and actually uh, ask the questions. So. And I, I want to leave a lot of time for people to ask. So I'll just I'll do a couple of like general follow up uh, ones before we, we do that. Um, so what advice 
would you give to filmmakers who are looking for a producer? I think like many people here are very envious of your collaboration <laughs> and wish to God we had a producer, you know, we could work with like Shane or with Sarah. Um, what would you recommend as, as, you know, for a filmmaker who is wearing all these hats and just don't have um, someone like that who can, um, they could partner with um, or, or just have that kind of creative collaboration with and support? I would just say, I just, it just reminded me of one other thing about executive producers and sure. Sandbox and others is, you know, one, and it's related to your question, Doug, which is like one of the most important things is when, is believing in you, <laughs> believing in the filmmaker, believing in the vision. And, and we certainly had that with Sandbox and have had that with other executive producers and that's essential. And, you know, you, you want to take, you want to receive um, resources and support and participation from people who who trust and believe in in what you're trying to do um but but sarah go go ahead for the rest of that answer i i totally echo what shane said um the way we really connected was um I, we connected uh through a sense of again kind of like a, a philosophy of filmmaking and a process that we um sh shared similar ways of seeing the world and curiosities about how to expand that and saw each other as perhaps catalysts in doing that. And I think that I, I personally so empathize with the like desperate desire to find your producer. Um, and also having experience as a producer, I know what it's like for people to, I, I know what that's like on the other side. Um, and I'll just say that the, the kind of recognition of, of process and story and just shared um, values and, and shared sense of meaning, I think is the most important thing. Uh, to, to look for. Um, I actually told myself I would stop producing uh, because I really want to focus on directing. That, that's really kind of what um, uh, what I love most on, on a film, but I found myself actually accidentally uh, producing a, a new project, um, a beautiful film called Orquidia by Emily Cohen Ibanez um, about the political and ecological life of orchids in Colombia. And the reason I got involved in that project was because um, I just loved Emily's very unique vision and how she talked about the project. There was such passion and complexity there that I couldn't help but like want to get involved and in, um, and conversations about the creative just turned into like accidentally supporting it as a producer. And so um, I'll just say it's it's that kind of infectious like passion and love and deep thought that um, I think if you can express as a director, um, yeah, I, I think that that's perhaps the most organic way to find a producer. And of course, there's the complexity of, of raising money. Everyone needs to, you know, ideally should be paid. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, hard and honest conversations to have. But I think if you're able to have the hard and honest conversations and be so ignited by the ideas and the process and the people, um, that can be a way into to finding, um, yeah, find, finding your, your collaborators. Do you think your um, collaboration, how has it evolved over the projects you've done to the point where it is now? I mean, are you collaborating in a different way now than you did at the beginning on your first project? And if so, how? Go for that, Jane. Uh, I, I think on Seer and the Unseen, we, uh, that was in 2016. Uh, so it, it's been... It's been seven years now um, of real collaboration. It's definitely evolved uh, significantly. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, we, we've kind of grown. We've included more collaborators who have taken on uh, certain roles. Um, I think that there's, we've really found kind of a, a shared language um, throughout our collaboration too. Um, I think that there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I've never it's it's I, I should just kind of pause and say I'm really grateful for these questions because that we've never actually had the opportunity to to talk like this, even though it's something that feels almost like oxygen now it's just it's so part of my life um, and our, our work. Um, uh, uh, but but I think that um, working together. Um, I don't even know how to summarize it. I, I feel like so much more is possible. I, I feel uh, uh, like we're taking more creative risks. Um, we're able to dream bigger um, because of like the, the trust and, and the collaboration. Um, um, yeah, it uh, enlarges that sense of, of possibility. 
Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Um, yeah, Shane, what, what would you say? Yeah, I think I think one one thing that's evolved is, you know, at first, I think working with other directors besides Sarah, I would learn different ways of working with them. You know, I think that's that's one of the things I try to do is really listen to the directors I work with and 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 make it, it specialize the relationship and the producing for what that director needs and what the film needs. And I think at a certain point, maybe at the very beginning of Fire of Love, I was taking something I had learned from another director and applying it to how I was working with Sarah and it didn't work. It wasn't working at all. And I think I, in that process, I realized I remembered what actually works with Sarah and what Sarah has taught me about producing with her. And so that, that, it wasn't an, an additive. It was actually a, a subtracting of what I had learned and contrasting it so that I could fully understand what made our collaboration special and what made our collaboration work. And that's something I find myself having to do over and over again. Uh, I sometimes am applying how I talk to someone else when I'm working with Sarah. And then I remember all of a sudden I'm like, oh, no, 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 Sarah is her own like very special, very extraordinary uh, human. And I, I, have to, I have to produce for and with her and just collaborate with her. And, and similarly, you know, one time I asked Sarah for advice about how to talk to another director and asked Sarah, like, how I should talk to them. And, and I tried it with this other director and it didn't work because that's how I should be talking to Sarah and not how I should be talking to this other director. And that made me realize, again, just how, how special and, and singular this, this collaboration was. And so I think the evolution for me has primarily been in the specificity of what it is to work with with this person and and on on this project that we work on and and um and and allowing and I think the other thing that has happened and that continues to happen is always allowing that to change and evolve. Um, we know what works and and we know how to how to continue to 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 make that work. But I I feel like the next project that we make is is going to be special because we have we we have a really strong foundation, but that we're going to be working from a new place, and and that's super exciting and, and part of that is yeah as Sarah said working with Elijah our, our our other collaborator and part of that is just um this evolution of our creative relationship I have a ton more questions but I did <laughs> promise that I would let others ask uh so I will hopefully be able to add you to the spotlight correctly as you ask but uh Mabel go ahead you're first hello um were happy Friday and um, thank you so much Doug and Shane and Sarah for, <laughs> I'm so excited to um, be listening and witnessing the discussion um, it's great to see uh, a, a great producer director from the Bay area representing <laughs> this incredible community and um, yeah a lot of food for thought for sure um, my pondering, is uh, specific to uh, my project. I um, I wish I brought a producer earlier, but it never happened. I, I've been, uh, for many reasons, the director producer of my film, and I have a solid rough cut that perhaps is perhaps is a defined cut. We're going to test it soon. But um, I still need to uh, raise funds, and for sure I need some producing help during post-production and maybe even for distribution purposes. But um, there is this part of, a part of me hearing a little bit on that conversation other, with other people that is like, a, you know, like mentioning maybe you need a producer, even, even though at this point, because it's your first film and you haven't been established. And so, um, even though at this stage, does it make sense to bring a producer in number two? Um, uh, hopefully the producer that comes in is, uh, has, a, uh, has a meaningful role, but sometimes I'm being advised to like, just bring somebody for the name. And even if they don't do anything, they'll still, you still be able to like get the funding. So I'm really have, uh, I'm still, trying to figure out how to move forward with this, um, and basically to, to, to be able to finish the film. Yeah, um, it's back so. to our time-honored question, I guess, of, of how we bring, a, when we bring a producer and how we bring a producer in. Am I correct, Mabel? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> Any thoughts, Shane, Sarah? You wanna start, Sarah? 
Um, well, first, I, I know of your project, and it's a beautiful and powerful one. And so I think anyone would be lucky to, to join it. Um, and, and thank you for, for being here um, with us today. Um, I, um, it, it's a really complicated question. Um, I can see why some people would talk about bringing a name producer, but at the same time, I think sometimes those things can really backfire um, and sometimes even occlude the work that you might be doing on your own. Um, I know that this is a personal story. Your, your, your film is, is about you and, and your journey. Um, and so um, I have just tremendous respect and empathy for people who are not only making a film, but also putting themselves in it. And so I could see how support could be very welcome. Um, uh, and so um, I, yeah, I, I would definitely champion you in, in finding a producer, um, but I would just want to make sure that it's, yeah, it feels like for the, a reason that feels at home for, for you, given uh, what a powerful and sensitive story this is. And, and so I think that's my circuitous way of saying, like, I see why people talk about name producers, but at the same time, um, yeah, sometimes those don't necessarily work. Uh, and then you have someone attached who uh, people might think that there's a producer on board, but they're not actually doing the work that you need to be done. So that that's kind of just my first gut. Um, I, I, of course, could be wrong. Um, but yeah, Shane, I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what you might have to say. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've come on board projects in, in all different stages, you know, just with with Stray and Elizabeth, I, we, Elizabeth just told me an, an idea she had, we were sitting around a campfire in Camden and she just told me the idea and that was the beginning. And we started just from one conversation before anything was shot or anything was written and to Elaine McMillian Sheldon, who I did King Cole with just recently. And she, Elaine had been shooting for several years and had already received uh, quite a bit of grant funding. And we were on a, on a Zoom call, a Sundance Zoom call for uh, grant recipients. And she mentioned that she wanted, she was thinking about it was time for a producer. And so that's when I came on, you know, several years into the project. Um, so it, there's, there's no sort of like one size fits all um, for when, when a producer comes on. But I, I think there's, there's maybe two ways to think about it. One is really just um, interrogating what 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 the project wants, what the project needs, and who might be able to help help with that. Um, that's like one way to do it. And the other way is oftentimes um, I find like when I'm when I'm coming into a project and working with a director, they are oftentimes have been working alone for a really long time. Um, even if they have some folks that are shooting here or there or had had spent a few days editing a reel. Um, there's just a sense of not having a, a partner, um, a, a partner, a creative partner to make this. And that's really, that can be really important and is, is really hard to find. Um, but uh, I think you can, you can sort of be open for that. And if you, if that's something that that's seeming desirable, be open for that and looking for that at, at any point in time. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if that totally helps, but, but I think there's, there's one way that's more assessing needs and wants and another way that's actually just wanting a, a, a more um, amorphous um, partnership to carry the project where it needs to go. And then the other component of all of that, of course, is um, attracting a person who believes in you, believes in the project, um, and and you feeling that that sort of combined respect, and also being able to, to support them and, and their labor, or to have them have a pathway to support themselves and their labor. Um, and yeah, so these are these are the considerations. I don't know if that gives you an answer, but at least maybe frames it with some considerations. Thanks, Mabel. Uh, AK. Oh, hello. Um, so nice to see you guys. Thanks, Doug, for such a great conversation. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet Sarah in my hometown of the Bay. But first time meeting Shane, um, all those India references just got me excited. You know, Sarah and I joked about her last name being Desi. You went to JNU. I'm just like, these white people from my motherland. No, uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing so candidly. This is so, so helpful. Um, I'm at an interesting point in my, I guess, film career where I was almost be like, all right, this shit is not sustainable. I need to go get a real job. But somehow my short film sold. And now I'm like, wait, I think I can do this. But during that sale, I had a very tricky um, 
uh, situation where simply seeking advice from somebody like, hey, this is the first time I'm making a sale. Can you advise? Try to literally take control of my project and the money. And I was able to save myself. But it just is so scary when it comes to not having good mentorship, right? As to like how people, there's so many vultures in the industry and that's scary. It also makes it really difficult to have the conversation with producers early on, someone who's established, like how much do I have to give up of my project? What if they don't, you know what I mean? So it's just, and now that uh, all of a sudden there's potential interest because now I've proven myself by selling a film. So part of my question is just how to even have respectfully a conversation of like, that may be too much for me to give up so early with somebody who's obviously established and, and can demand that cut or that fee and a fee and this and that, you know what I mean? Um, and there's sadly not enough guidance around talking about money in our industry. So that makes it even more tricky. Um, so I don't know if you have advice on how to approach those early conversations about how much to give up, how not to, like what's right, what's not. And sometimes, you know, I've been heard when this person was trying to take control like oh networks don't do deals with individuals i'll just have to control all of this and i'm like no i'll make a shot company you ass like it was just so blatantly trying to take advantage of people but so it's just such a scary place to be as a as a inexperienced uh young filmmaker so i'd appreciate any advice you have on that but i'll follow up with you individually again but thanks for sh being here and sharing Money, Sarah, Shane. What Sarah, you, you want me to start? Um, yeah, uh, great question. And first of all, I'm just so sorry that you had that experience. That's horrible. Um, important lesson, though. Very important lesson early. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And you know, um, yes, for, of course. Um, and it, it's good to have that perspective. You know, I, I think we're a lot of us are making films because we ha we have yeah anyway I'll, I'll spare that part of it but uh to, to answer your question I think one of the things is anything that I, I would say anything that's not feeling right um might not be right and it's worth it's worth talking to other trusted peers um and just just getting their sense just getting a like a, a a second opinion on something um so when that that producer comes in and just has one sort of advice uh, session with advice and then says like they own the project and you're like, wait, is this normal? Is this what it is to be a producer? Like, it's good just to ask that question of other filmmakers um, and, and to, to see what, what is more customary, um, but really listening to what, what feels, what, what is like feeling appropriate and respectful and, and in honoring of the project of the film that you want to make. Um, and when it's, when it's not feeling that way, uh, there's, I think there's a romantic, there's this romantic notion that, you know, making films in order to make a good film, it has to be like a horrible work environment. And the, and the like executive producer has to care only about money and the director has to be a tyrant and, and all of these, all of these sort of stereotypes. And, and I, my experience is that's, that's not true. That's just simply not true. And, and it's hard work, but, but we have to make the films and in, in the spirit in which we want to make them. And um, yeah, just like listening to listening to yourself and honoring that and getting support. You know, I think there's also in power dynamics, of course, at, at play there that are really hard to negotiate, hard to identify and then hard to negotiate. And so making sure that that we have allies that can can identify those and can support us if there if a conflict emerges or if you have to wrestle back control of your project, for instance, that that um yeah, and 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 I guess just like you know, this is a community just like we're, you know, we're, we're not alone. Like we, we do have each other to support one another in, in all of this. And it's important to, to, to give and receive from that community. Yeah. Uh, were you going to add anything, Sarah? Or, uh, I, I'd, be, I'd be curious, um, what do producers, generally, when they come on, if it's an experienced producer coming on, what do they typically ask for? Uh, like a percentage of what they raise? Is it a flat fee? Is it, um, and I guess the same would go for executive producers. You know, what are, what do uh, they typically ask for besides credit? 
And in my, well, just to briefly add that what Shane said at the end about community, I really just want to especially uplift of how grateful I am for spaces like the D Word, spaces like the DPA. There, there's a ton of great organizations um, too, Brown Girls Doc Mafia. There, there's many places that um, think, I feel like people are coming together and, and sharing information about budgets, about rates, about the money that can feel so taboo and tricky to talk about. So I feel like that kind of information sharing and alliance building um, filmmaker to filmmaker is super, super important. And so I just wanted to specifically shout out how important that is. And, and again, AK, I'm so sorry that that happened, but I'm glad that it's being discussed in, in a forum like this. Um, uh, but Doug, yeah, to answer your question, in my experience, um, it really depends project to project uh, and what the kind of financial structure is already in place or the needs of, of the director, whoever is originating the project. I've seen producers ask for just, you know, something very kind of vague um, in the past uh, or something very specific with um, with regards to, you know, points on the back end, a fee, a credit, uh, and a, a very clear, um, uh, you know, a schedule of like how they'll be involved. Um, so it, it really depends. But I think the most important thing is clarity um, and having kind of a documentation of, uh, you know, of the conversations thus far. Um, but it really, in my experience, has uh, yeah, run, run the gamut of uh, what producers look for when, when they're first engaging. Uh, thanks. Um, Simon, you are, let me add your spotlight. There you go. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the sessions. Very, very useful. Um, so yeah, I've got a question. Um, so Shane and uh, Sarah, what specific advice or sorry, what general advice would you have specifically for first time directors working on their first feature? They were dealing with different types of producers, how to work with them, when to get them in, you know, how to make contact. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends on on where, you know, it's where you are in your process. You know, I think a, a first time director can can be able to garner a certain level of support on their own without producers. They can have maybe grants or they have have pitched before or, or different things. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, when Sarah, help me out. Like, what is, can you speak specifically for what it is about a first time director and, and their relationship with getting producers? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's, to me, it's about, um, yeah, your connection to the subject matter. Uh, like, why, why you? Like, what, what is it about you um, and your relationship to the story and, and what is so special about this? story um that's kind of the first thing like I, I know when i receive emails from people who i've never met um who uh, might be first time filmmakers um <clears throat> i'm not necessarily thinking like oh they've never made a film before but if like if the story is like oh whoa that's super interesting and then i learn more it's like oh yeah i see why this person and why this film that that's the kind of thing that will um you know i'll, I'll gravitate towards um so but sorry so to interrupt. So it's okay to contact um, producers you haven't met personally. Um, or should I, I, you try and meet them at festivals first, for example? I, I personally think that uh, if if there is the opportunity to meet in person, that's the best. Uh, or at least I, I can find. I personally see that as as quite effective. Um, I think that so many people are so inundated with emails that um, they might not necessarily be um, as as quick or able to, to just respond to someone that they don't know. Um, so I think, and there's also that, again, coming back to serendipity, I, I think that mm -hmm. there's those kinds of connections that you meet, um, people that you come across and, and are drawn to, uh, it's that kind of thing that um, will also allow you to know, like, is this person right for me? Not just like, are they, you know, um, yeah, so, so all to say, um, if, yeah, I find festivals to be in a, a fantastic place uh, for finding potential collaborators. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think especially first time filmmakers have such a burden on them. Like I, I remember what it was like for me, how excruciating it was to, to try to, to, uh, to find my, my first people. Um, and you do have to do that extra work. But I think if you believe in yourself and, and trust yourself, that's something that will also resonate for others who are meeting you too. Um, but yeah, Shane, I'm curious to hear. How yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think it's it's if you can meet, you know, you can approach producers as if I'm working with the first time director now. You can produce that. You can approach them and 
sell them your idea and and share. Yeah. And I think, you know, the important thing for me when I when a first time director talks to me, I'm I'm sort of wondering why they're approaching me and wanting that to be specific, like what it is, what is it about me that they want? And usually it's not, it, I'm not really excited to work with someone because they want someone who's like made big films or something like that. It's more, more um, specific. And then I think like, you know, as Sarah was saying, showing us a passion and a, a care and, a, and, and that this film is supposed to be made by you and that you're sensitive to the suffering of this world and hoping for the alleviation of it in some way like that, you sort of share a, a sense of a kind of value with the producer, I think is really important. And so I'm I'm sort of scanning for for values, passion, and like specificity, maybe. And then and then also um yeah, it doesn't you don't have to have sort of all the ducks in a row, as it were. It's it's just a a general capability and a capacity to to make things happen is also something I'm looking for. Yeah. How about so, somebody who can be Simon, a bit I gotta cut you, Simon, okay. I got to cut you off because we have too many other hands raised. But um, one thing I would thank you, I, thank you. Uh, one thing I would uh, add is that um, you know there's some really special festivals to go to that have markets attached to them, like Hot Docs, IDFA, Little Sheffield in the UK where you are, and um, a lot of filmmakers looking for funding, whatever, make the mistake of just going after the commissioning editors and funders when there are incredible opportunities to meet potential producers and, and talk to them in a really informal setting. So, um, you know, just I would just highly recommend doing that, maybe going to some of the conference sessions where they're on panels and talking to them afterwards. Is Great always point. To yeah. introduce yourself and then you can follow up with an email that's thanks. a great i've had several several directors that way exactly um thanks simon uh right. francelle you are on hi can you guys hear me yes we can well i'm very close um this question sort of has two parts and actually makes sense to have one be a little more sarah and the other a little more shane so um because part of the thinking of finishing a film i think comes out like editing helps you think. How much more would you um, prefer to Sarah, prefer to work with like a predator, producer, editor, um, then uh, especially if you're already at like rough cut one phase, then a creative producer at that point, do you think that there's something you get from the people who have their hands and can like make some of the changes themselves? And then um, to Shane, like, do you feel that you can do the most good coming in on day one? Or do you think like you can be equally helpful with a film that's just starting editing or like at rough cut phase? Or do you really like to just do like pre-production? Like finding the best match for the film at the phase it's in as far as creative producer role. Those, those are really interesting questions. Um... Your, your first question, I feel like I'm I'm not the best person to answer that because I, I have um, an editor I've worked with for many, many years across projects. And I have Shane as a producer that I've worked with for many, many years across projects. So it's hard for me to, um, I should, I sh should challenge myself to think expansively. Um, Does uh, Shane ever work with your editor almost without you there or like with you there, but like, do they work together a lot then? Mm. You're, you and Aaron are close, but we've, I don't think, I'm sure you and Aaron have had conversations, just the two of you, but, but it's always been like the three of us pretty much. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you, Shane, but I, I work very closely with like, I'm in the edit room all the time. Um, I'm not someone who like, yeah, I, it's really important to me to have a very collaborative relationship. And so, um, and like Aaron, my main editor on Fire of Love, we had two editors, Jocelyn Ship, who as well, who's incredible. And I also always hope to work with moving forward. But Aaron, uh, I'll typically, when I'm just starting a project, I'll, I'll start to talk to her about um, story and thoughts and ideas. Like there's a few projects we have in development and I've already been talking to her about those. So um, she's definitely an editor. Um, I'm sure she would, you know, could be a great producer too, but um, but yeah, I feel like it's just, I've always just incorporated her throughout all the stages. Uh, I don't know if that's directly answering your, your question. Um, yeah, but, well, um, why don't we move on to Shane's reply for the second question. Um, also, we're going up against the, the time, uh, Shane and Sarah, can you stay for a few more minutes? Is that okay? Sure. 
or do you need to go off somewhere? Um, I have I have five. Yeah, I have a call in five minutes. But yeah. Okay. But, um, then I would just ask. Let Let's. Um, let me. I'm sorry, friends. Uh, let me get to the last three questions and be as succinct as you possibly can. Um, so that would be that would be very helpful. Um, hold on one second here. Technical thing. Okay, Emily, you are on. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. I'll be quick. So um, I saw somebody put this question in the chat also, and I know um, it's been sort of a conversation in the documentary world of what are your guys' thoughts on making documentary subjects producers? Because I know that there's there's been some, I was listening to an interview with Margaret Ratliff from the documentary subject, and she was talking about um, they're running into issues with even getting the documentary placed and distributed because some of the subjects were in these power positions. Is that okay <laughs> to do that? Sarah, you probably have a better sense than me. Um, I, I haven't yet seen subject. I, I'm really curious to see it. Uh, I've heard it's such an interesting and an important um, film and, and conversations uh, catalyzer. Um, uh, so forgive me for speaking without the, that full knowledge of, of, of that film. Um, I think it's a super important conversation uh, to be having. And I think that it really especially speaks to these complex power dynamics between participants in the film and the filmmakers. Um, but I don't think that there's a one size fits all um, answer. Um, I think that there's really important protocols and series of questions that we should all be answering or asking ourselves about our power and positionality and perspective with regards to the people in our film. Um, but I don't think it's like a blanket statement of like, yes, sub subjects slash participants should always be producers or not. Um, I think that's an evolving conversation uh, and that there should be kind of that active process of consent throughout. Um, and if that evolves into some sort of a producer role um, that feels like organic and, and mutually arrived at, um, great. But it might, it could, I could also see where it could be harmful um, and just further concretize power dynamics. So um, that might not be the, the kind of answer you're looking for, but I would just really stress um, honest, direct, um, and, and um, consistent communication um, uh, that minds the well-being of of the people in the film throughout the process. Thanks, Emily. Uh, just uh, two more very quickies, Bill, and then Poppy, and then we are out. Thank you for being here. Quick question: uh, When is it appropriate to reach out to a sales agent, and do you have any ethical and efficient ones that you can recommend? I think you can reach out to a sales agent really at any time, but it's I. I want to reach out to a sales agent when I think they would take on the project. That's sort of the simple answer is it has to be, you, you can do it on a pitch sometimes because it's the pitch is so strong or you have to develop a little bit further so that a, you know, a project it sometimes doesn't know itself until you've been able to work on it for a little while. So it's really knowing your project and when it's, when it's not just when it's sort of, you can express what it's about and when it, when a sales agent will think that they could sell it. Um, as far as what sales agents are, are ethical, I mean, I think sales agents' primary function is to to sell the film, and they'll they'll do whatever they want, they'll do whatever they can to sell the film, and they're 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 they can be ethical, but their responsibility, as they see it, is to to sell. So it depends on what kind of ethics you're looking for with the sales agent. We we've worked with um, Submarine; they've they've been really good um, with the films we've worked on and good to us. I've worked with Synetic on. Um, uh, on King Cole, Dog Wolf. Um, I think those are actually the only three sales agents I've sales agencies I've worked with, and yeah, they they all function differently, but have have been effective in in what they do. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Poppy. Thank you, Doug. First of all, thank you everybody for all the informative comment com content. Um, I'm a, I'm a journalist, and this is the first time I'm actually stepping into documentaries with the whole woman life freedom movement. And now that I'm on this journey, so to say, a lot of people say you should direct it and then you should find a producer for it. And then some others say that you should produce it and find a director for it. And, you know, this is very different from doing something that's on the news. So I'm kind of 
one question leads to the other question, I'm kind of in a dilemma, which route should one take? Uh, I've never directed, I have produced before. Um, I just wanted to, you know, this, uh, I'm, I'm in a dilemma kind of for this, what should I search for? I, I guess, um, yeah, um, Maybe this is a cop out, but my first thought is just what what, what do you want? Um, if, if you feel excited by directing, um, if you feel like you have a unique vision, um, something that's really special that uh, only you can really provide, then I say go for directing. Um, if that just doesn't feel right, if, if like you, you start to embark on the directing process and it's just like, you know, I feel better in this producing role that, that you know, then, then I go to that. Um, for, for me personally, there are films that I take on as a director because I, I feel like I'm kind of obsessed <laughs> almost. It's like I, it's the only, I'm so excited to, to think through these projects from this specific directorial and creative way. And there's other projects where I know I'm not the right director for this, um, but I still really believe in the project and I want to support it and I can do so as a producer. Um, <clears throat> so um, and I want to be involved. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, for example, this film I mentioned earlier, Orchidia, it's a beautiful um, film. Uh, when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I kind of wish I could direct that. But I was like, no, Emily is the right director for this and I want to support her. Um, she's the right person to, to make this film. Um, so um, if there's just any kind of interrogation or, or questions you can ask yourself, and if you notice yourself getting really excited about the idea of directing, I would lean into that and, and explore that a little bit further. Thank you. Um, we are out of time, folks. So uh, I want to respect Shane and his schedule and his need to, to leave. Um, but I just, <clears throat> we're very happy this was a therapeutic experience for you, Sarah. <laughs> Hopefully, Shane. Um, we really, really appreciate your coming on. It, it's it both really helpful for a lot of people here and, and inspiring to see what a great collaboration, a, a model of a, a great working relationship can be.